Hi, my name is Chelsea Kernick, and I am here with the Alexander Valley Film Festival for another panel. This one is the final panel that I am hosting in conjunction with the LGBTQIA film block. And I have been excited for this, honestly, since before I even started booking. This is a panel and a film screening that I envisioned three years ago back in 2018 and reached out to Alexander Valley Film Festival and everything's kind of come around. So today we are going to be talking about the 2000 documentary Live Nude Girls Unite. And alongside that, a conversation which we were calling Sex Workers Rights Today. And that is going to be part of the conversation, but because we have a couple of legendary activists, including Carol Lee, also known as the Scarlet Harlot, who's been doing sex worker justice longer than I've even been alive, I think it's also a really cool time to talk about kind of the origins of sex workers' rights in the Bay, diving back even farther in time than when Julia Query's film takes place. So, we have with us Julia Query, the director of Live Nude Girls Unite, and Celestina Pearl, who is a femdike and an activist through St. James Infirmary, um, has been involved with St. James since 2003 and working with them since 2018. I'm going to let Celestina tell us about uh, what St. James Infirmary does as well. Um, but before we get started, we do have a land acknowledgement that I want to read. And I did say I was ready, but I didn't open this. So I need one moment to do that. And before I read this, I will just also note at the end, we thank um, Nikki Myers Lim at the California Indian Museum and Cultural Center for assisting with this acknowledgement. And that is a really, really awesome organization and center that is in Santa Rosa. Nothing, nothing in here describes that it's actually a local organization, but I'm super grateful. And if you have not been there, I honestly don't know if they're open to the public right now because of the pandemic, but they do a lot of really amazing amplifying of indigenous local stories. Um, so with that, can you, can you say their name again? Uh, the California Indian Museum and Cultural Center. They used to be, I think, somewhere in San Francisco and they moved to Santa Rosa a while back. Um, so the Alexander Valley Film Society recognizes that we are on unceded lands of the coast Miwok, Pomo, and Wapo. We respectfully acknowledge the indigenous people who have lived here for thousands of years and who continue to contribute in meaningful ways to their communities and our society as a whole. Our shared history includes the genocide, forced removal, and ethnic cleansing of indigenous people. AVFS is committed to centering indigenous voices and stories and to recognizing the past and celebrating the resiliency of native people and their culture. Our deepest thanks go to Nikki Myers Lim and the California Indian Museum and Cultural Center as mentioned, and also to Clint McKay from the Pepperwood Preserve for their assistance in this acknowledgement. You can visit our website at avfilmsociety.org backslash equity to learn more. And then if anyone has a question at any point in time during the panel, you can put it in the chat and we will try to get to your questions. We're gonna have a lot to cover with a very short period of time, um, but we definitely want to hear from you and lost my place on all these screens. Okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I am going to just say hello to Celestina, Carol, and Julia. It is such a pleasure and an honor to be speaking with you all today. Um, when I got on the phone with Julia and brought up this film, it's been um, I was really excited that Julia still feels enthusiastic about it and still revisits it herself and and was like very forthcoming about saying that it's still so impactful today, which I think is still so relevant, which I think is an amazing testament to the film and also, you know, not awesome for the state of sex workers rights, which are constantly, um, it's a constant battle. But Julia, let's start by talking to you a little bit. You made this film 
20, 21 years ago at this point, what, what was it like to be making this film um, when this was actively your community and your workplace and the fight that you were fighting present tense? Well, it was a, it was a community effort. Um, I mean, it, the film features uses me as a storyline, um, and because I think it's really useful to have a, a character storyline. But the film was was made by our community, and it was made better by our community, who saw it multiple times as I edited, and I got lots of feedback. Um, many, many people did the work to make this film. So it was very much a, um, a beloved project of the community. And it was during that time. And um, it came out 21 years ago, but you know, it took five years to make. So it's really 26 years ago that this was this active time. And um, it was, uh, it was a time when, to, to steal Lisa Goduldig's old joke, it was a time when San Francisco was filled with people who had disappointed their parents. And that is not true anymore. Our city has had multiple booms and busts since then, but it, it is no longer um, filled with an artist class. And that's what we, what we were then. We, you know, we were children of immigrants and we were students and we were artists um, and that, that grouping came together in this frothy, yeasty, bubbling over place that was San Francisco at that time. And it's just not that anymore. Yeah, I, I feel that really palpably and, and have been kind of, that's been really at the forefront of a lot of news lately. I don't know if you've seen these articles about- Yeah, like it's San Francisco over. over. I mean, well, thank God, let's make it over so that we could have it again. Because um, when they say is San Francisco over, they're really talking about um, very wealthy and overworked young tech workers who are paid too much, but overworked. And it's a kind of a strange form of exploitation for them. Um, and then, but the, the immigrant population uh, including the, the tech worker immigrant population are having children who are gonna be the new artist class. So in another like 15 years, San Francisco is gonna be filled with really international artists. Um, I don't think it's gonna be LGBTQ. I think it's gonna, I think we're moving in a, in a way that moves us out of that as an identity formation in the same way. Um, but I think we're gonna see the, the third gen children of immigrants making really exciting art in San Francisco in about 15 years. The ones who've seen their parents work at tech companies and put in all this labor and not, not be happier from it or, or you know, just have money but not art and they will, they will explode. So I'm looking forward to that. I am, I am intrigued by this line of thought um, and I, and I want to dig into that with you, but I, um, but I'm gonna shift over to Carol because one of the things that Carol does as um, an activist and an artist as well is to organize a sex worker film and art festival that's been happening for decades. So Carol, I wanted to ask you, and this is also a question for Julia um, with regard to Live Need Girls Unite, what is the power of um, sex workers making films? And, and like, what do you think is how do you think sex workers and the movement for sex workers' rights is effectively amplified through like arts and film festivals? Sorry, you are muted. The constant Zoom problem. Uh, you know, first of all, there are so many sex workers doing such extraordinary work. I mean, it's, it's an entire genre, and one would think there would be a range of, uh, of critique, maybe coming out of the academy or, or in general, and I am surprised that I haven't seen more theory about the kinds of sex worker films there are. And, and, and I look at you know, activist films, narratives, and I, I think that I'm very surprised that there hasn't been uh, more about the delineations and the kind of work sex workers are doing. It, it's really very shocking. I'm um, thinking a lot these days about a, a piece by um, 
uh, Aquinos and a PJ Star about the whore gays and where they have kind of, uh, yeah, I mean, it sort of takes a, after the, the his, historical issues within feminism and, and uh, pre-feminism about the gays and how that determines the content. And to finally have work, we're saying, I mean, Julia's is, was in the forefront. So to, to have the work we're seeing that completely uses the whore gaze and is the whore gaze, defining the rest of the world. So we are seeing the world through Julia's eyes. And I think that was really profound. And again, I'm so surprised that it hasn't been looked at yet. And, and very deliberately in that, in my film, I was using something um, about the, the law of the mother. Okay, so a Julia Crete article, this is from like 1994, who knows, but uh, an understanding uh, a flip on the Lacanian ideas. So that if you see in my film, I never mentioned my father once, he doesn't show up. People often assumed I didn't have a father, that I was like some raised by a single mother who had, had sex with some passing man who abandoned me. In fact, I'm very close with my father. He's an environmental scientist. He's a lovely man. He cries at the opera, right? He's, I have a good relationship with my father. He lives in Santa Rosa. We go hiking every week, okay? I've always had a good relationship with my father. I did not become a sex worker because I didn't have a good relationship with my father, okay? But I deliberately made a film where he wasn't included so that not only was I using the horror gaze, which we didn't have the word for then, but obviously I was using that, um, but I was also setting us up that the tension was not between me and patriarchy as the articulated one. Obviously that's there in the form of the lawyers, right? That's there in the form of oppression. But the, the emotional tension is with my mother Right, and we're setting us up as this revolution of feminisms, the birth and rebirth of feminism, the power of the daughter and the power of the mother over and over again. And it cuts out masculinity entirely. And that was deliberate. I didn't fall into that. I read theory. I made a, a, a piece of work that was entirely informed by my intellect. But when I wrote grant proposals, I would include so many errors so that they would give me money to save me. It worked. It, I knew that if I came off as too smart, they think, why the fuck is this smart girl being a whore? Wow, and, and it's so evident. I mean, so to give folks a backstory because some people tuning in probably won't know this history. Carol Lee, who's with us, is credited with coining the term sex work. And my understanding is that that term is to um, take away a hierarchy or so-called hierarchy that some people like to attribute to like the forms of sex work that are legal and the forms that are not legal and to say that there should be a unified fight on behalf of all people working in any form of the sex industry that they're all workers um, so but with that in mind there are like you were part of this scene julia around this peep show strip club um, where you talk about in the film, a lot of the people there had college degrees and a lot of the people are, were choosing this work, not because it was fun, um, fun as is talked about in the film, but it, but it was a conscious choice and it is work and it's work whether you're doing it out of necessity, like street-based work, which I think Celestina will be able to speak more about given that St. James Infirmary does a lot of street-based outreach um, or the kind of work that like your mother was doing and at the time of the film, Julia, um, in connecting with people who were doing street-based full service sex work, um, whether you're an ex escort, whether you're in the porn industry um, or whether you're doing like stuff in legal legal bars and clubs like, uh, like the Lusty Lady, which has since closed. Um, but I think that's a really fascinating thing. And I love that because there is this conference that happens in the film, you actually do get to touch on a lot of the different types of sex work that people are doing. So it isn't just a film about your one club or even about that one form of sex work. Yeah. And, and doing that was also a deliberate choice. And when I was offered full funding and a really, really great offer from uh, PBS to do it, make it a POV documentary, 
um, and make it only about me and my mom. And I rejected that immediately, like on the phone when they offered it to me, even though it's, you know, 10,000 people start documentaries for any one that ends up in POV, maybe, maybe more, right? It's really hard to get that spot. But I knew that wasn't the film because it's not a solo story, it's a union story, it's about everyone. And I knew it was really important to talk about the hierarchies within sex work, the variety of sex work, and yet the need to have sex work liberation across boundaries, which might be a great way to go to Celestina. Yeah, so I was gonna ask, I have two questions to open up um, to get Celestina sharing with us. I do want you to talk about what St. James Infirmary is and does and what you do there. But I also wanted to ask, um, when I asked you over email if you've seen this film, you said you saw it at its debut at the Roxy. So I would love for you to also talk about your experience in the year 2000 seeing this film. Um, yeah, I remember going to see it at the Roxy and I remember you were there, Julia, and I just remember being absolutely thrilled that I was in San Francisco at that time, at that point in time, and just all of the, all of the radical performance and, um, um, you know, sexual performance and labor that I was involved in. At, at that time and and community that I was involved in at that time so it was it was really thrilling to get to be um at that place in time when the when the movie was showing and um yeah and within that context it was like the Lexington was thriving just you know a couple blocks away uh I don't remember going there afterwards. I don't know why, but <laughs> we definitely would have. And, you know, it was like Michelle T wrote Valencia and, you know, there was just, there was just such like you were saying, Julia, you know, there was just definitely like a culture of people that had disappointed, <laughs> probably disappointed their mothers. Um, I, um, uh, that wasn't really my experience. <laughs> But um, if I had the kind of mother that would have been disappointed by the stuff that I was involved in, then that probably would have been the case. But, <laughs> but definitely, uh, yeah, definitely we were, you know, there was lots and lots of community to be a part of that, you know, people were, you know, just, you know, I really, it really felt like sex work, and <clears throat> sex work and queerness and performance were just all having a real um heyday at that time you know we just that just doesn't exist right now um sadly um yeah so i don't know if that kind of answers that question but yeah definitely like that was very exciting to be a part of for me at that time Absolutely. and i and i and i had just and shortly probably I, I mean if that was 2000 then it was probably shortly thereafter that i got involved with st james infirmary too and it was like a lot of the same community can you tell folks who maybe don't know about st james infirmary what that organization does and what you do with them absolutely um so St. James Infirmary um started in 1999. Um we started out as a once a week uh little clinic, little pop, almost like a pop-up clinic after uh after City Clinic closed. So that was San Francisco's STI clinic basically. And um and St. James got funding to uh run this clinic after city clinic closed for the night on the same uh you know in the same clinic and uh yeah initially i mean we would have lines around the block you know people waiting for the doors to open um a clinic uh run by and for current and former sex workers people could come in and get medical services Reiki from Dami Boo and massage and the clothes closet and uh, dinner and groceries and peer counseling. Um, yeah, so just, a, you know, a, a pretty good amount of services uh, to start out with. I mean, it was really amazing for it to exist at that time. Um, and now fast forward to today, um, we're over at 730 Polk Street in the Project Open Hand building. And uh, in addition to the things that I mentioned, we've got, you know, we have our outreach program that um, 
the van, the late night van outreach that started in 2018. Um, we have a really cute van we call the Naughty Nurse Mobile um, that's all outfitted, super cute inside. And we go out on the streets at night and, uh, you know, bring all kinds of supplies, resources, um, you know, even services, peer counseling, some medical. The HIV and STI is on hold for right now, but, um, but you know, someday we'll get back to that. Um, and uh, and you know, we check it, we check in on folks that um, during the pandemic we started a delivery service. So we bring uh, we bring groceries, produce, and you know, other necessities, hygiene products to people um, that are homebound. And then, uh, you know, and then we have this whole time we've been bringing um, what we call hope packs to the um, to the street based sex workers. So condoms, lube, uh, wipes, mints, uh, flyers with information about us and other, you know, other relevant uh, other relevant resources and information, uh, as well as sometimes even cash money uh, through rad mission neighbors. Um, we're sometimes able to bring uh, bring cash out to the folks working out on the street. Um, we we started uh, around that same time. We started a whole uh, uh, housing program for trans folks. We have a we actually have a physical location that is a three story home in the Mission for trans folks, as well as um, a housing subsidy program. Uh, so trans folks can apply and depending on their need, they'll have, you know, whatever corresponding percentage of their rent paid for, for uh, the set amount of time of, of, you know, that they can be eligible in the program. Um, we have a mental health program. We have syringe access services. Um, probably missing something, but, <laughs> but we have a lot of you know, we have a lot of services, um, including coming out and doing, you know, public events like this. Oh, I almost forgot to mention, uh, yeah. Um, I also uh, I also started a sex worker online series called Dear Sex Workers, We Love You, and that's been going really great. Um, we just, we're all the time adding new, uh, new offerings to it. We have, you know, stuff like, um, uh, every Monday, Vedan does mindfulness and self-care. So there's like, you know, breathing exercises and meditation and um, and that's a really good one. I love that one. Um, fitness classes, finance classes, um, uh, just like peer support groups. Um, we've got an art, like kind of like a peer art therapy group coming up. Um, uh, on May 7th, well, actually, we have an ongoing uh, parents, uh, pa uh, parenting and sex, sex, sex work and parenting, sex work and parenting group that I do with Juba Kalamka, and uh, and then uh, intro to intro to online hustling, I think is what it's called, also on May 7th. So a lot of really good offerings through the um, through our online series too. I'm really excited to um, come back to you to hear about what the pandemic has been like for sex workers and, and a lot of people having to make that shift onto online. Um, but I also want to say St. James Infirmary is named for Margot St. James, um, who died very recently and was a tremendous activist um, in the sex worker community of the Bay Area. I know that Carol and Celestina are working on a May Day event to honor Margot's life, but I would love to talk to Carol. We call this a Sex Workers' Rights Today panel, but I want to really um, take a look back at how long the Bay Area has been a hub for not just, um, not just sex work, but sex workers uniting to um, be visible and actually fight for human rights and workers' rights. So Carol, could you talk a little bit about who Margo was? Celestina, you can also jump into this conversation, but I'd love to hear from you all about who Margo was and, and what kind of her life in summation is like, was like. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna unmute you again.
You're muted, Carol. Okay, great. Thank there you, you so much. Um, well, um, Margot began uh, to be active and really came out in sex worker rights in 1973. I mean, there was kind of a, a precursor there, but she um, formed the first prostitutes rights organization in the United States, Coyote. And she was quite brazen politically, politically. She was a strategist, and I think that's how she managed. Um, now, you know, in 1969, there was also a, a group of sex workers, transgender sex workers, including Tamara Ching, who's among us still, uh, who started a, a, a kind of a riot at Compton's to protest the unfair treatment they got at, you know, their cafe, really. So um, people look back now, in fact, a San Franciscan, uh, Melinda Chateaubert, professor now, uh, looks back 10 years ago, before Margot even, and looks back at the ways in which uh, San Francisco in general, our whore communities were building and rising and, and New York too, but, but probably about San Francisco today. And, you know, and also quite oddly, if we go back a little more like 1917, 1917 they had like a big church action where there was this bad preacher who was always trying to limit their rights and badmouth them. And uh, it was 300 prostitutes showed up at this church and you can walk, it's a, I don't remember what street it's on. It's like right about, oh, uh, it's Nob Hill, Nob Hill right there. And um, you, you know, and the prostitutes were complaining like, saying things like, you know, well, this is a position we're in economically, you shouldn't chastise us. And they were just so out front and so bold. And we can be really proud of how sex workers have organized in this city. It's, it's just been an anomaly and it, it's been so exciting. I mean, I guess, you know, you know, in the 1800s, the first women who came over were sex workers. And that, um, and the kinds of relationships with Asian women who were brought over were contextually could be called trafficking. And the, I don't, unsubmissive women by Benson Tong has a thorough discussion of the diversities of experiences there. And, and, um, and some of the first laws that San Francisco passed were specifically racist laws against uh, Chinese women. So Margot comes into the scene. It was after the beat scene and, and, and you know, after years of protesting the Vietnam War and the people around her were bohemians. Um, they were uh, informed to a large extent by feminism and by uh, labor rights and, and certainly the civil rights movement. So uh, they were hippies. I mean, this was, you know, how they evolved. They were sophisticated hippies who were really down at, down home. And they, uh, Margot came out, she was a Renaissance woman and I hadn't quite realized that before, uh, before this organizing process. But you know, she was a detective. She grew pot, the best pot ever, I'm told. So this is all official information. Um, you know what? She, reproductive health, she could perform an abortion. She could help with that. She uh, was, um, a, a marathon road runner. I mean, like a serious, co serious competition, a real marathon road runner. And I know I'm forgetting a few things because the list is incriminal, incredible, incriminal, and the list is incredible. And um, so she really does step forth as a marathon woman and, and to know someone like her and the way she grasped sex work and, and took all her skills in being a publicist in using notoriety. And that's what she applied to this issue. She was also extremely good at attracting people around her to, to take this forward. And oh, through the process of our collective, you hear one after the next person say how much they loved Margot and how Margot would find them and they would find her and Margot would take care of them. And they were just loving her and they really cared about Margot's cause. And Margot worked so hard that the, all they wanted to do is come and be around her and work this cause. And, you know, I mean, mostly they were whores. A few, 
I mean, like her main sidekick, Priscilla Alexander, actually my mentor, was a labor rights activist. Oh, queer, didn't I not? Did I forget to mention, of course, queer activists all over the place, but she was a great queer activist. And, um, and when I heard and didn't know when she came in, things got a little more serious. Like, I guess there were a lot of parties and, you know, Mar I mean, you could plan the prostitutes rights movement high too. That, that worked out well with your inspiration. But uh, Priscilla Alexander, uh, you know, got things down a little and, and, and we, and, and began writing v volumes about sex worker rights. And truly the beginning of the movement was intersectional in terms of the philosophy. And I think this is something people don't realize that came out of, of course, that kind of meld of civil rights, feminism, labor rights. Now, then in the 90s, when the sex worker rights movement got bigger, because remember in those early days of Margot, there was only a handful of people everywhere, all around the world. There were little pockets and you weren't dealing with a huge movement. But then as the movement Oh, Carol, you froze for us. We'll give it a minute. Both in, in prostitutes rights, but also in, in, in sexual rights. So those people uh, began to talk about what was impacting them. And I think the, there was a, them personally, which was fear of arrest, children being taken away, blackmailed by your partners, I mean, can I tell you a more horrible list or the, the kinds of abuses at the clubs? So that, I don't want to go on and on because I could, but that was, you know, and then so we, our movement changed a little. Then we went through also a backlash about what was going on and wanting to get back to the intersectional analysis. And um, so, I mean, I could just go on, but I think I'd rather, let me stop at that point right now, okay? <laughs> And we should probably also mention that uh, she ran for uh, as a board of supervisors um, and uh, and in the presidential race. It's incredible. Um, do we know what years? Do you, do you know that off the top of your head, Carol? She ran. She ran for the SF supervisor in ninety eight or ninety nine. It couldn't have been any other year than. 90, it was in 96. It, was it 96? I no, thought it was. I don't know. I think it was 97 or 98 or 99, but I don't, I know it, it wasn't 2000 and I don't think it was 96. Was the presidential one 76? I don't remember because I am too young for that, which is a rare <laughs> sentence for me to say these days. <laughs> but the. Yeah, those, those sound approximately right. So I, at least that gives some people a ballpark. And she but, was yeah. really exciting to listen to. She was just really charismatic and exciting to listen to. Oh, Carol, you were right, 96. I really love that you all know each other and have known each other for decades. It's such a like, exciting aspect to this conversation. I feel like I could just like disappear and let you all do all of the talking. <laughs> um, and had I known that you all knew each other, I might have actually planned this that way. Um, but I wanna turn to, um, I actually just wanted to acknowledge, this is not something that I mentioned before, but I was just looking up something about your film, Julia, and I saw an obituary for your mother um, who died just this past October as well. and was doing activism in a very, very different, from a very different angle, as is extremely clear in your film, but nonetheless working um, to care for sex workers. So, uh, and was I think like three years younger than Margot, they're, they're pretty much contemporaries of each other. So if you wanna say anything about your mother's life and, and what happened between you after the film, I would be fascinated to hear more on her. Well, I mean, I miss her, which um, kind of surprises me. We had a difficult time, you know, but um, boy, I really do miss her. And um, we, you know, we got closer again. Um, 
my mother was better at being a hero than she was at being a mother. And I wanna say that that's okay. I really doubt that there are many male heroes out there who were good fathers, okay? Like it is okay. I, um, even as a child could see that I could love her more by seeing what an amazing doctor she was and how devoted and committed she was to her patients. Like we had her, her funeral outside of St. Vincent's where her old office used to be in that little corner there. And someone walked by an older woman and said, Dr. Wallace died, she saved my life. You know, just, just a person walking by. Um, and my mother was really amazing in her work for women. And she was um, incredible in her ability to see people and yet not see me. And that was really uh, a tension, but it's okay for that tension to exist. We can honor her and love her, and I do, um, and acknowledge that her drive and her open-heartedness didn't turn inward to herself. She was not open-hearted to herself nearly enough. And, um, and that also made it harder for her, even though she loved us all so much, it made her, it harder for her to receive our love. Uh, the image I have of my mother is that she was endlessly working and endlessly hungry and there was a buffet all around her. Thank you so much for, for sharing all of that. I, I, I meant to ask you in advance whether it was okay to ask because it is a recent loss and I'm, I'm very sorry to all of you for the loss of Margot and Julia for your mother. I, I know these were really powerhouses of people in, in your lives in complicated and profound ways. Well, if there's a wannabe filmmaker out there, I think you should interview maybe um, the children of Dolores Cuerta and me and like some of the other amazing, amazing activists and see if, if you know, how we no negotiated having a, a mother who doesn't fit the cult of motherhood. I would absolutely watch that film. I hope someone does do that. Um, I relate to that. I relate to that so much. Yeah. And just my heart goes out to you. I know it's hard losing one's mother. And, you know, my mom died um, a few years ago and it's a complicated relationship. Yeah. But, and yes, I would love to see that movie too. <laughs> that sounds great. Celestina, can you talk about, um, can you spend a little bit of time talking about how the COVID pandemic has impacted sex workers that St. James is interacting with? And, and yeah, what, absolutely. what you're actually seeing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I mentioned that we had started the, um, the, the delivery uh, service. And um, that was one of the first things that happened um, was like the financial impact and, uh, you know, just so immediately what we started doing was meeting people's, um, meeting people's needs that were, you know, very basic needs, you know, so just trying to get money for folks, housing for folks, food for folks. So that, those were some of the biggest things. And then just also, you know, feeling a lot of the, just, just feeling a lot of the stress around um, how, you know, people had to make that difficult decision between, uh, you know, between making a living, paying their rent and, uh, risking their lives. So, yeah. So those those are definitely some of the some of the challenges around around the pandemic. So you know we got money from Rad Mission Neighbors to try to help people out with that. You know we were you know we were scrambling to increase our housing program and 
um, yeah, and going to the food bank a lot more and bringing groceries and produce to folks. Um, and just like, you know, I think a lot of folks were really missing the community aspect, the community support aspect of, um, you know, of, of St. James. And, uh, you know, so I feel like I was a little, I was a little late to, you know, get started with the, with the online series, but, um, but, uh, but I'm really glad that we got started with that. Um, I was so busy with trying to get all the other basic needs that, you know, the like, the community stuff was kind of was kind of falling by the wayside, but definitely it was it was apparent that so many of us and myself included were just really missing, um, you know, just being able to be in community with each other. So that was you know that was a big one. And can you talk a little bit? I, my understanding is that even people doing forms of sex work that are legal, like working in a strip club, weren't eligible for a lot of the. Um, like COVID relief that, that people. Were yeah. Doing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Because, um, you know, lots of people that I know, um, were in that position of, um, trying to figure out like ways to kind of, um, you know, word things in whatever different kind of ways and people were figuring it out, but it's, you know, but very challenging. But yeah, some people are figuring out how they could get different kinds of support and aid. Um, but, uh, but all kind of quasi legal. So, um, but yeah, we actually had a workshop on it. And um, uh, might try to see if we can actually offer it again. Um, but yeah, it was one of our uh, community advisory board members that um, had kind of figure out some tips and tricks to kind of kind of work the system a little bit but it just really sucks that people should even have to um like one of my best friends ended up in a situation where she was you know she was she was working on it for a couple months um just trying to figure out some kind of financial support because you know i mean folks even folks who are you know doing legal forms of sex work um were in financial you know were were in a lot of financial stress i mean People, you know, people in the strip, I mean, the strip clubs closed, um, the massage parlors were closed. Um, yeah, so, and, you know, just a, a lot of loss of income just from, um, you know, just, just from, you know, different kinds of, um, you know, different kinds of sex work that, uh, you know, may even be legal, but, you know, loss of, loss of income you know, loss of, you know, their businesses, just like, you know, just like so many other legal businesses. And, and just to see the morality play of that, like, it's a public health epidemic. The obvious thing is that you need to make sure people who make their money doing very close personal work that's unnecessary, you know, by, you know, it's not healthcare, um, shouldn't have to go do that, right? the obvious public health of we want to pay everyone who would be doing that so they aren't doing that is and yet that was you know overlooked it, it just brings us right back to the activism of the AIDS crisis you know that these are these are the same issues over and over again in this country where ideas around morality get in the way of public health yeah, I mean, even businesses that should have been eligible for, you know, I don't know if folks remember this from like, even this started happening in the very beginning of that, but of the pandemic, um, you know, businesses that were, uh, you know, that had some sexual content, uh, sexual connection, um, sex toy stores, um, uh, porn sites, et cetera, um, were being exempted from, you know, were being exempted from pandemic, like small business stimulus help. I'll let this be a question to everybody. I would love to um, talk a little bit about some of the uh, some of the like legal issues um, or threats like legal threats to sex workers that are being introduced as bills right now or what are like the biggest issues that sex workers are fighting for either in connection to COVID or outside of it right now. But before that, I would love if anybody here wants to just take a quick moment to actually 
like define decriminalization and also touch on like what the Nordic model is and why that's like a big red flag that often is getting tossed around as something that that would happen for folks? Like people- Is it okay if I jump, jump in a little bit right here? Yeah, let me make um, this a little bit more clear just because I know you know what I'm talking about, but um, yeah, so what, we've talked about forms of sex work that are legal and forms of sex work that are illegal. Um, people doing illegal forms of sex work are generally not organizing for legality, they're organizing for decriminalization. Um, and then sometimes we hear about like milestones or news articles that seem like they're getting at decriminalization, but they're actually not fully there and doing something different. Yeah, so I can touch on that a little bit. Um, I certainly would love to hear um, Julia and Carol's perspective, but um, uh, uh, decriminalization uh, basically just means exactly that, it, that it wouldn't be illegal anymore. And then legalization um, is kind of, you know, like think about like, um, like uh, legalizing cannabis, you know, so then it would be regulated and controlled by the state, taxed, um, you know, it would, it would bring in a lot more, um, it, I think it would bring in a lot more police involvement and government involvement in, um, in ways that have already historically proven to be very problematic um, and also, um, and also very racist. Um, so, you know, as, as, you know, those who may be in the know a little bit, there's been a lot of racism in the way that um, legalization of cannabis ended up being rolled out, that it was to the benefit of those, you know, it, it greatly benefited those who were um, already very privileged and, you know, and it, you know, that while, you know, while there's so many black folks that, you know, have, you know, lost so much of their money and livelihood and freedom um, being incarcerated for, you know, being incarcerated for it. So, um, so I think that, I think that model is a really great example of hopefully how we could do things differently um, in regards to sex work um, and specifically um, uh, sexual, sexual services that are currently uh, criminalized. Um, and then you asked about the Nordic model, and so the Nordic model is where the client, um, the the recipient of the sexual services, or John, um, is criminalized, um, and that is also problematic because you know if you think about it, like what kind of business is going to be, what kind of business is going to say, hey, we would like for our uh, you know, for our clients to be criminalized, like that's going to be great for our business, right? No, of course not. So, you know, so that it just doesn't make any sense. It's like, it's still penalized, it's still penalizing um, sexual services. Um, and then, uh, and then I just wanted to give a plug to um, SB 357, which Carol and I are both uh, part of the uh, of a coalition called Decrim Sex Work California, um, and we're working with Senator Scott Weiner's office um, to enact uh, very similar legislation to what they just passed in New York um, to repeal uh, the loitering with intent to commit prostitution laws. Um, so yeah, so we just passed through the Senate. We just passed through the Senate Public Safety Committee, um, and uh, now we got to get through the Senate Appropriations Committee. So uh, we're working on it, uh, and uh, you know, it's it's a step. It's 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 a step, but you know, sometimes it can be a little. It can be challenging to feel like, you know, as as one of our as one of our comrades and one of our groups just recently had had said, and that's really sticking with me, is that we really need to think about decriminalization as being the first step, you know, in 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 really like supporting and granting full human rights uh, to sex workers. I think also that the Nordic model is such an obvious safety risk for sex workers because it makes, it's not going to stop people from seeking out, like, I think the reason that people like that model or want to put forth that model is still very um, condescending and, and uh, 
morally demeaning of sex workers and sex work in general, but it tries to do this in this way that shifts the responsibility onto Johns or customers. And in doing that, now you have like a very glaring reason why somebody would not want to share their identity, their real identity, or do any of the things that actually make dangerous Johns identifiable so that people doing sex work can remain safe from them. And considering how many legislators are Johns, I don't really understand why they would be for the Nordic model. <laughs> very, very valid point. <laughs> Julia, did you, it seemed like you were gonna say something about this. No, okay. To just say a few little things about decriminalization and it's just, it's just so many definitions and there's no real official definition, you know, and these people who promote the Nordic model and the client uh, crim criminalization, they call it decriminalization because it means what it says, it means you take away some of the criminalization. So the term decriminalization, unfortunately, can be used in all sorts of ways. And we've been dealing with that in our movement for a long time. But, you know, there's something that it really rang forth and allowed us to be creative when we're talking about decriminalization. Now, the net network of sex work projects and most of the charters I've seen that prostitutes have developed say that what we wouldn't be regulating prostitution according to criminal codes, that we would use OSHA regulations and that prostitution would be regulated as other businesses. And that I think makes a lot of sense, but there are still many people who want to have no laws at all. I mean, who take that stance. I'm not exactly sure what, what you know, what the details would be. But I, I do think that when I look in the movement and look at the discussions around decrim, I see that, but there are models. The New Zealand model is what the sex worker rights movement points to, where it, where things are controlled by a body of primarily sex workers. And that has been the most popular model so far, but it's, a, and I mean, we used it on the San Francisco Prostitution Task Force, most of the participants unbeknownst to Terrence Hallinan, most of us were sex workers, had been former sex workers, but so that's a good model. Um, also, I think that when, with the Nordic model, that's only been done in places where it's more uh, legal. So in those European countries, it's a little more legal you could maybe only do it on a, in a, a brothel region or maybe you can only do it uh, on a certain street or maybe I mean there's a lot of rules it's problematically regu regulated it's not decriminalized but they have not applied as far as I know I'm pretty sure they have not applied the Nordic model to a place that is already criminalized this will be the first time so in Canada, you know, as we know, in the U.S., when we looked at Canada, we thought they were pretty legal there. There was a lot you could do there. And they applied it there. So one of the worries I have about decriminalization and et cetera, and I'm um, echoing what's been said uh, by Celestina about the um, creation of wealth for people who are already privileged is I believe we'll see the uberization of sex work where there will be massive owners who will open up SM parlors and, and dungeons all over. It'll be a kink talk kind of, you know, you know, how, you know, kink talk on TikTok. So it'll be um, promoted and they will hire young women. Um, they won't have the safeties. They won't understand um, how to do SM in, in safe, sane, consensual, and also just, you know, really careful ways. It will be, um, sloppy and the money will go upwards and well, really you know, don't important. forget they've already done this in, in i mean australia's been through this it's not like there's not a lot of information about how to deal with this they've been dealing with this for decades so yeah that, that seems like a problem i don't r remember what i read about how they're dealing with that but it's a constant strike but they have ideas i mean they're working on it that is, in capitalism how do you control that? The whole world should be grateful to us for we are in the forefront in the labor in labor movements, figuring out how to address these things. Even the, though we're the, the last ones to in. The next step after decrim or the next step after creating some form of legal is without being legal, you can't unionize. The reason we could unionize at the lusty lady and 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 full service workers couldn't was because we had legal status. The only way to stop um oppression, whether it's from, you know, 
pimp style illegal oppression or from uber style legal oppression is through the ability to organize as a group. The only way you can do that is if you have some form of legal status in this country, at least. Um, I mean, yes, there's a whole anarchist understanding of things, but you know, so far that hasn't done as well as unions. <laughs> and we can look and we can look to like how strip clubs are run and you know see how sex work is is exploited you know when we look at like legal forms of sex work i mean you know so like like you know i think we all need to adopt that philosophy that decriminalization is the first step in many and it has an advantage in that, you know, sometimes if, if it's legal, it'll be Uberized. So there's this race, if it's legal, between Uberization and unionization. And then there's, you know, in it, when, it's e when it's decriminalized, there's still other forms of oppression that you have to work against. Um, but there, there's so many folks who just can't imagine the idea of, of, of people treating each other well behaving themselves like it's just like it, it's it's kind of wild to think that you know that the government the largely male cis male heterosexual government can't really imagine a world um that doesn't have to be completely controlled at every step of the way and if it's not controlled then people will exploit and you know behave badly I would really love to make a request. Um, I know Julia mentioned a couple of like books and things related to um, essays related to sex work and also related to like the theory that you were working in in your film. If you would write the titles or drop links, if any of you want to just take a moment and drop some links for like further reading for folks, I think that would be incredible. Um, I want this conversation to go on for hours, but more people will watch it if it's only an hour and we stop. Um, and we're just kind of coming up on the cusp of that. So I want to take a moment. I'm going to talk about the shirt I'm wearing because it's one tiny way you can support a cause and also like support it financially and represent it visually. Um, I started a volunteer group with some friends in Santa Rosa in 2018 after some bad laws called FOSTA-SESTA passed and a local sex working artist out of Oakland named Jonah um, designed this logo with a concept that I had and these shirts, um, you have to email to get them, but we sell them for $25. It's a suggested donation. They cost $12.50 to make and the other $12.50 goes to organizations. Sometimes it is specifically St. James Infirmary. Sometimes it's organizations like them, but I still have these and I have them in a lot of uh, shapes and sizes up to four or five X um, in a pink t-shirt. And then we have like a muscle tank so if these interest you, I'll put the email in for this shirt. Um, and please, for the three panelists, stay on because I will take down your information so that I can get you these shirts for free. Um, they are free to workers and activists. Um, but I'm going to put that in the panel. Does anybody remember the name of the book that came out just a couple of years ago that was that um, it was that series of uh, it was like a, it was it was done like a, like an expose kind of uh, uh, this was it this was in around the time of that 1917 uh, uh, uprising that happened at the church that you were talking about, Carol. Um, and, uh, and it was like uh, one woman's story of her experience of, of being in sex work. And it was told over time in what I think it ended up becoming the SF Chronicle. But it, before that, it was, you know, it was the local newspaper. And she and so it was like a like a like a weekly serial or something like that. And then they compiled it together into the book. This was just a couple of years ago. Alice was the name, it's something about- Alice. Alice. Yes, yeah, oh. Alice. That was, I think that was a really great one. I love the that one. Reflections of the Barbary Coast or something. I, Alice was in it. I, I, I don't remember the name. 
Well, make sure if you are watching this right now, make sure that you memoirs grab the of the Barbary Coast mm -hmm. prostitute. That's it. Alice memoirs of a bro. I have a video uh, uh, website teaching about trafficking. I I like to recommend because that's mine and it's very instructive and I really deconstructs what tra how trafficking has problematically impacted sex workers and how the disc how the framework has been problematic for it. Thank you so much for that work, Carol, because that really, people need to hear your perspective on that because people just so often conflate the two as though people mm -hmm. need to be saved from both consensual work and non-consensual work and get lumped together. So yeah, harmful. I'm gonna take one minute, I'm gonna read these out loud because if anybody watches this video later, you're not gonna have all the things in the chat. So. Carol recommends Unrepentant Horror, The Collected Works of Scarlet Harlot. And then Sex at the Margins by Laura Augustin. And then The Law of the Mother by Julia Crete, spelled C-R-E-E-T. Alice, Memoirs of a Barbary Coast Prostitute. And then there's a video at sexworkermedialibrary.org backslash, or sorry, slash collateral damage. That's what Carol was just mentioning. And uh, also the Sex Worker Film Festival, the San Francisco Sex Worker Film and Art Festival, which you can just Google by that name. Um, and then the shirts, you can email uasonorthbay at gmail.com about those. Um, stands for you. Oh, margosaintjames.com. Right? Are they oh, yeah, are, yeah, yeah, yeah. going to happen before? Are they going to see this before the... Uh... Oh, yeah, before the show, uh, uh, the memorial on Saturday? We have a few viewers right now. And then yes, you can have this video and keep people can keep watching after the fact. Okay. So that was the last thing I was gonna do is turn it over to you to talk about this memorial celebration that's happening May 1st in two days, uh, celebrating the life of Margot St. James. Well, and the cool thing is that um, it'll be live on Saturday, May 1st, 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. So you know, figure it out if you're somewhere else, it's, you know, the time difference. Um, but it's also going to be recorded. And so uh, it'll be available on margostjames.com. Yeah, or, and they can, oh, okay. we want everybody to register. So everybody has to go there right now, margostjames.com. And it'll be really easy to register. The show lineup is good. I noticed, so don't worry about being a little late. It starts slow. They get that that's the time to come in. I just watched the whole thing and it is profound. And it's really going to have you feeling very inspired about sex workers and really deep into the rights. And plus, Margo's other friends are there and her family, her sister singing gospel song it, i can't so wait it. it's, it's gonna be so good. good so great it's gonna be so good oh. and, we, and they can buy memory merch they can buy merch and they can oh, yeah. donate to the cause and donate to and they can donate to the infirmary and donate to the project it's a little expensive just to do it you know so and then calpap and the center for sex and culture yeah, the merch is the merch is really cool. Um, I know we had mentioned earlier that um, Carol, sorry, <laughs> that Margot had started a group called Coyote, um, which which stands for Call Off Your Old Tired Ethics, and um, and their original logo, um, which was also on uh, Coyote Speaks. I think, no, Coyote Howls, of course, oh. Howls, Coyote Howls, that was her paper that she put out, and, uh, and so, yeah, you can get a t-shirt that has that, that has their, the logo on it, I got the t-shirt, I love it, it's, it's, it's really cute. Thanks and for mugs. come up with the best acronyms for everything, I was just glancing back at your Wikipedia, Carol, and saw that you were going to head to Texas and start an activist group called TWAT. I don't remember what it stands for. My car broke down in Tucson, Tucson Horse and Tricks. So we did twat there, Tucson Horse and Tricks. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much. I, I really wish I could keep this conversation going for hours. It has been an honor and a pleasure to bring you all together and to be able to 
Carol, it's lovely to see you. Everything. Oh, I'm so glad to be with all of you, Julia. Your movie, I still watch that movie. It's one of the most important sex worker movies ever. It not only does it not ring true, it seems like it was made yesterday. I mean, it's just like, it's of the times. It's not just, yeah. it is of the times right now. Truly. I, I feel I feel kind of starstruck just to be like <laughs> on this panel with with you all. It's yeah, I'm yeah, huge admirer, huge well, admirer of both of you. You've grown up because you know when we met, you were you were a baby dyke. You were you were I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but Carol feels that way about me. She knew me when I was, you know, like in my <laughs> teens and twenties. So we have like generations here. Yeah, I was probably 24 years old. It's so special. It, I feel like um, even if I could just be a fly on the wall in this conversation, it would be an honor, but getting to actually pick your brains about sex work and this movie was just, like made me gleeful. And honestly, it feels like in my brain, I didn't connect with you all until later, but it really is something that we like dreamed up in 2018. I was like, we got to show that film. We got to get a panel going from St. James and bring in people. And it's just been like such a joy to actually be able to do it with, with the support of an already existing film festival. So thank you to Alex. The festival everybody. was fabulous too. We got hiatus this year, but hopefully it will be back. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank Thanks, you. Chelsea. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. <laughs>